Good afternoon, everyone. I know I have got the worst slot possible, which is right after lunch. So I'm going to try and keep this as spacey and as interactive as I can. And I would like your cooperation in order to do so. Uh, the topic is nourishing a culture of innovation in marketing. So when uh, first Eileen and Vivek and team approached me, I was like, this is a huge topic. And there are so many different aspects to cover. And innovation in today's world is no longer how it used to be before, where innovation means you're talking about rocket ships and landing on Mars. Today, innovation is all about your daily lives. And I think Vivek brought about some very good examples of how we need to constantly update apps, of how there are so many ways in which everything that we do has changed. The way we travel, the way we consume media, the way we watch films. It's all totally different now, and it is because of all these innovations that are happening in the marketing and the tech world. When I first moved to Singapore, it was 18 years ago, I had to call my parents, of course, uh, back home because I was really missing them. So how do you think I made those calls? Anyone? International calls, 18 years ago. Public phones, remember calling cards? That's what I used to use. And I could not call every day out of the question. Once a week, if I was feeling rich and I had not spent any money shopping at Watson's. So there were a lot of things that I had to think about before just wanting to make a call to my parents. And today, how do you think I do it? Free, WhatsApp international calls, FaceTime. I can actually see them. It is fascinating. I mean, now it's become such a part of our daily lives. But when the first time FaceTime and WhatsApp video came about, you're like, this is great. So now my mom's hooked on to it. But then, of course, it has um, a whole downside to it because then I get pictures and videos of random things or she wants to FaceTime how she has actually changed the sofas in the living room. And then you get into the other op problem of too much data. My dad has recently got onto WhatsApp. So every, forget the jokes and everything, you all know when parents and elder relatives get on technology what happens. Every morning I get a good morning. And I just feel obliged not only to reply good morning, but to try and say something else. So every day I try to think of something to tell him. It would be as random as my son missed his school bus today or I have a meeting. And then I realized my life is actually not that interesting. So it's very difficult to every day think of something. Today I was very excited because I told him, oh, today I'm very excited because I'm going to be talking at this event. And he immediately replied, oh, send me the video. And I'm like, what? But then actually it was a very fair ask because for all you know, this could be live, live streaming sometime. So then of course I told him, I said, no, there's no video, this is about work, I don't think it's going to be interesting, so let's just move on. So moving on, what we're going to do today, I've got an R with you, and no, it's not going to be all about me, but I'm going to quickly tell you a little bit about me and about R3, the company that I work for. So I am Seema, I have been in Singapore for the last 18 years, I have uh, done my master's in management studies, but I have always been in the agency world. Uh, worked with Ogilvy and McCann across advertising, above the line, below the line, CRM, shopper, whatever you name it, all of it. Five years ago, I joined R3 as the, uh, I'm a principal consultant there. So I work on accounts like uh, Economic Development Board of Singapore, MasterCard, uh, Unilever, and several others. So firstly, in my contents, I'm going to take you through uh, highlights of a book that we have recently written. Uh, R3 has written this book, which is called The Asia CMO. Here we spoke to 13 CMOs across Asia and talked to them about exactly this. How is marketing changing in today's world? Now, why we like to think of it, this was like PM Lee's talk at Hard Talk. It's no, it was not that dramatic, but we did get a lot of good insights and uh, great conversations with these uh, CMOs and some of those highlights I'll be sharing with you in today's topic. Now, as I'd mentioned, innovation and marketing is a huge, huge topic. So I have tried to bucket it in three sections and make it more bite-sized for the audience because there's no way you can cover everything. You probably need a week just to talk about it. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is how the consumer has changed. We all hear about our millennials, the me, 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 me generation. So we're gonna talk a little bit about them in the context of marketing and how do brands need to change how they talk to these 
new consumers. Next is going to be technology and how technology has disrupted marketing. Because the old age of doing marketing where we used to have our prints ads and watch our TV ads or see billboards, it's still there, but even that is changing. And of course, there are so many new mediums and channels and ways of marketing now, uh, thanks to technology. And finally, no one person can do anything alone. So there is this whole ecosystem of partners that's available, which is beyond just your agencies. Earlier, it used to be, okay, I have an agency partner. I'm going to work with that agency. And now I'll be showing my age when I tell you that when I started in advertising, media was part of the creative agency. There was one agency. You didn't have a creative media, social, content, UX, UI, and all these different agencies. There was one agency that did everything for you. But today, that whole framework has changed. And not only do you have agency partners, you have these big boys, which are called the FANG, the Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, which have completely changed the dynamics. Earlier, when you were looking at advertising, no brand or marketeer is going to go and talk directly to a TV station. You have a lot of middlemen, someone who will plan, someone who will buy, someone who will negotiate. Now, Facebook and Google are knocking doors on brands, and they're trying to give them solutions that are customized. So the way marketing has done has kind of uh, broken a lot of walls between media and publishers and agencies and brands. Now brands are actually talking directly to consumers. Because why do only people who work in advertising have bright ideas? Consumers do. So even brands like Unilever are looking at how they can do crowdsourcing. So this is a big part of how innovation is happening in the partnership landscape. And then finally, at the end of my presentation, we will do a recap and Q&A. But feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions on anything that you see up here. So a little bit about R3. We are very proud to be a Singapore homegrown company that has become a global company. And in fact, here, um, my boss and the co-founder of R3, Xu Fen Go, was meant to be here to talk to you, but she is in London on work. Uh, so she is the co-founder of R3 as well as the president of IAS. The reason for our existence is we want to help marketeers get better at their marketing when it comes to effectiveness as well as efficiencies. So everything from looking at marketing ROI, are, are you working with your right partners, are you investing your media money properly, all this would be something that we look after. We like to think ourselves as coach where we help different agencies and marketeers come together to actually have the best optimized marketing plans and solutions. If you can play the video. Who is R3 and why are we here? We are here to help you answer some of your toughest marketing questions. How can I evaluate my marketing partners to improve performance? What is the return on my media and marketing agencies? Which digital agencies should I be working with? What's a fair amount to pay them? How can we best align with our marketing partners to help grow our business? We've been in the business of driving highly collaborative, effective, and efficient solutions for our clients since 2002. And since our founding, we've expanded globally to provide in-market support. Our work now covers more than 65 countries and eight of the world's top 20 marketers. Most of our senior consultants are ex-agency heads or marketing directors, and we make it our business to offer the best counsel possible with independence, with insight, and with integrity. So if you have any questions, we are here to help. Uh, we are proud to work with eight of the 20 biggest marketeers and brands in the world, and you will see a lot of your familiar names uh, over there. And in addition, we spend a lot of time and effort to do research to keep abreast of everything that is happening in the marketing space, where things change so quickly that no one person can be an expert, and it's very important for us to keep on reading, keep on learning, and these are some of the different publications we have. All of these are available on our website, so you can feel free to look at it. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, I want to first start with showing a video about how well today marketeers can know their customers because of technology and data. Everybody on the floor, this is a robbery! Don't move! Don't move! Take it down and stay out! Money, money. Open the ball. Mr. Johnson? Eric Johnson? How does she know your name? I don't know. 
Your mobile app pinged us when you walked in. Looks like you were on our website and thinking about buying a house. You're moving out, man? I need my space. You may think you can't afford a new home, but we have some amazing new rates. I could text them to you. Those are fantastic. And Mr. Davis? Yeah, it's me. Did you click on one of our emails about consolidating your student loans? Maybe. Oh, well, we can help you with that, too. Hey, 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 what, what are you doing? This is a robbery, remember? We gotta go! Come on! Can I lock those rates in on the app? Oh, well, of course you can, sugar. Thanks. <laughs> It's not really far from the truth. With the amount of kind of digital footprint that we are leaving behind, it's scary how much complete unknown strangers know about us. Uh, now, this is a quick question. This is a doorbell. Imagine you're standing in front of a door and it's, this is the doorbell. How would you ring this doorbell? It's not a trick question. It's very simple. How would you ring it? How? How would you press it? Like this? How many people over here are in their 20s? Anyone? How would you press it? Would you also press it like this? Yeah? What they say is that there is a new generation of people who are called the Thumb Tribe. They would actually press this doorbell like this. And I tested this on a lot of my, uh, my son and his friends and that's the way they actually press doorbells because this is the generation that has grown up with mobile phones. So texting is extremely easy for them and they use their thumbs. So the thumb is become, they are more dexterous with their thumb than they are with their fingers. So if you remember in, when, in our days when we typed, and I still remember my dad's typewriter, we used fingers. We are familiar with our fingers, they are familiar with their thumbs. So this is a real study done across nine cities across the world to identify this thumb trail, the thumb tribe, which actually uses thumb instead of the forefinger for most of the things. So it is fascinating as to how we use our bodies has changed because of technology. I don't know how many of you know these guys. He is, um, he's just too funny. You should look him up. And I love this quote of his. He's written a book on modern day romance. Uh, today, if you own a smartphone, you're carrying a 24 seven singles bar in your pocket. And he says that today, any, any geek, any nerd, anyone who has no game, it's so easy to actually start chatting with a woman or the other way around just because you have all these kind of apps and you have this beautiful thing in between two people which is called a filter. You can say things, it makes you bold, it makes you ask people out a lot more simply. And this again has fundamentally changed the way people view relationships. And that is true even closer to home in Singapore with the number of dating apps, not only the likes of Tinder, and don't worry, I won't ask who wants to put their hand up and say that you're on Tinder, but I'm sure many of us are. And, um, but that's the way there are lots of local apps that are coming up and online dating is just becoming a very accepted and common way of meeting new people. So many, many years ago, my son is 14 years old now, when I think he was around seven years old, his school called parents to come and give a talk to the kids. The topic was then versus now. So how were things when you were growing up, as in when parents or grandparents were growing up compared to now? So I showed this picture. Half of the class had no idea what this was. The other half had seen it in movies or something, so they knew it was a telephone. But what amazed me was a question that uh, one of my son's classmates asked. He asked me, what can you do with this? And my answer was, it's a phone, dude. You talk with it. But later when I thought, I'm like, it's a very fair question because for them, this, this is a phone. And what can you do with this phone? Lots of things, right? You can do pretty much everything. You can tell people random stuff on Snapchat, which goes away after, what, 10 hours or something. I've never understood the purpose, but that's what you can do. Um, you have a lot of bragging rights. You can put up pictures on Facebook, get people envious about where you're going and how fancy your life is. Uh, for your entertainment, you can read uh, Donald, Trump, uh, Donald Trump's tweets. Um, 
you can ride with strangers in Uber Pool or um, Grab Hitch or uh, Grab Car. And uh, so random people you don't know and you're actually sharing rides with them. You can be healthy. You can monitor sleep patterns. You can track your runs. You can monitor your heart rate. You can spend money on everything from groceries as well as to high-end fashion. Whatever you want, it's just a click away. Uh, you can waste a lot of time playing Candy Crush, of course. Um, you can find food. Now, while I was typing this slide out yesterday, I was chatting with the millennials in my office. One of them has four different apps to order food. I get it. She has seven apps, which are food review apps. So I'm like, why would you need seven apps to review and then four different apps to order? But that's the way it is. She's like, why not? Like, you'll be informed and you'll know what you're going to eat and how it is. I was like, okay. Uh, you can get lost with Google Maps if this is me. And then ultimately, I end up asking a human for directions. Uh, you can party with Spotify. Who needs DJs? You have Bluetooth speakers. And that is what you can do. So this is the way our world has completely changed with technology. What's a telegram? <laughs> Again, not a trick question. Everyone knows what a telegram is? Hands up. Yeah? This is my version of a telegram. This is a, this is a telegram today. So for ones who didn't know, and I'll be very honest, I did not know this until again a millennial in office told me, telegram is a new messaging app that's more than messaging. It's a WhatsApp, but better. Because not only can you WhatsApp, or you, not only can you message, but you can play games and compete with your friends. Again, I think it's a waste of time, but of course, that's just the way this generation is doing. So this is their version of a telegram. Now let's change gears a bit and look at what the Asian CMO is making of all these. This new technology, these new uh, consumers that are there in the market. This is one of my uh, favorite cartoonists. He calls himself a marketoonist because he does cartoons based on marketing. And now, more than ever, a CMO's job is beyond marketing. If a CMO does not move needle on business, he is out of a job. There is no way now you can just be concerned about your brand and be concerned of marketing and promotions. You have to make an impact to the business. You have to deliver. Um, so we wrote this book where we interviewed a lot of CMOs. We asked them questions about what are the challenges they are facing? How is their brand growing? How is technology disrupting their business? These are some of the people we uh, interviewed. You'll see a lot of uh, names you will recognize. We are very proud that we got um, EDB's chairman, Mr., uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bae Swan Jin. Uh, you see over here we have DBS, Singtel. Uh, we have startups like Chop. Uh, we also wanted to not just keep this to big regional and global brands like a MasterCard or Coke, but we also went to Thailand, to Indonesia, to India, and we spoke to emerging and startup brands over there. So for ones who have not seen the Gojek case study, which is a brand out of Indonesia started maybe two years ago or so, I would encourage you to go watch it. It has fundamentally changed the way people in Jakarta live and how life has been made so uh, convenient for them. Uh, the brand Cafe Coffee Day is uh, the Starbucks of India. It was very interesting talking to the CMO there because she was explaining how from a tea drinking culture, that's what an Indian, uh, Indian as a nation is. In fact, I think I'm the only Indian who does not drink tea and I, I need my coffee fix. Uh, it was interesting how they're actually attracting uh, consumers. Um, Mitra is another great brand which is uh, a fashion online retailer, uh, kind of like the Indian Netta Potter. So it was fascinating talking to these people from diverse markets, but all of them are facing similar challenges and of course have the same opportunities because in the global world today, there are no walls and no barriers. Um, we also did a survey and some of the findings you're gonna see in this presentation here, and these are the different brands that participated in the survey. So these are senior marketeers who are global, regional, as well as local marketeers. And what again, they told us about marketing and innovation. DBS, for example, it's fascinating. DBS is one of the age-old uh, Singapore brands. They're around um, 
They have so many people in the organization. They say that there are 20,000 plus. But one of the ways in which they have, they became the digital bank of the year last year. And one of the key ways the CMO told us that they had to do this is because they need to start acting like a startup. And this is DBS. Like when you think of DBS, you're like, hmm, they seem to be, you have associations with POSB and they are the historic legacy bank. Uh, but no, actually they are propelling themselves very fast into the world of fintech, e-commerce, m-commerce, m-banking, and uh, they have realized that if they don't do this, then they're going to be left behind. So one of the things that we asked um, the CMOs was, um, how prepared do you think are you to face the future? Um, so 86% said they were, which is heartening, but all of them pretty much said that they need, and their team needs an upgrade of skills. Um, we asked them, do you think your marketing strategy is innovative? And only 3% totally agreed, because everyone knows with the way things are changing, you need to constantly evolve and do more innovative. Now, I'll come to the first pillar of innovation in marketing, which is the consumer. This is our consumer reality today. They, are, they want everything and they are going to actually look at every kind of channel to get it, plus they want it now. Um, this is a very interesting video on the millennials and how they, how they think and how they, believe, how they behave. So if you could just stress, play this. Stress, right? Now you add in the sense of impatience. Right? They've grown up in a world of instant gratification. You want to buy something, you go on Amazon, it arrives the next day. You want to watch a movie? Log on and watch a movie. You don't check movie times. You want to watch a TV show? Binge. You don't even have to wait week to week to week. Right? I know people who skip seasons just so they can binge at the end of the season. Right? <laughs> Instant gratification. You want to go on a date? You don't even have to learn how to be like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to learn and practice that skill. You don't have to be the uncomfortable one who says, says yes when you mean no and says no when you mean no and yes when you... You don't have to swipe right. Bang, I'm a stud. <laughs> right? You don't even have to learn the social coping mechanisms. Right? Everything you want, you can have instantaneously. Everything you want, instant gratification. Except job satisfaction and strength of relationships, there ain't no app for that. They are slow, meandering, uncomfortable, messy processes. And so I keep meeting these wonderful, fantastic, idealistic, hardworking, smart kids. They've just graduated school. They're in their entry-level job. And I sit down with them and I go, how's it going? They go, I think I'm going to quit. I'm like, why? They're like, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you've been here eight months. <laughs> you know? It's as if they're standing at the foot of a mountain. And they have this abstract concept called impact that they want to have in the world, which is the summit. What they don't see is the mountain. I don't care if you go up the mountain quickly or slowly, but there's still a mountain. And so what this young generation needs to learn is patience. That some things that really, really matter, like love or job fulfillment, joy, love of life, self-confidence, a skill set, any of these things, all of these things take time. Sometimes you can expedite pieces of it, but the overall journey is arduous and long and difficult, and if you don't ask for help and learn that skill set, you will fall off the mountain, or you will, the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, and we're already seeing it, the worst case scenario is we're seeing an increase in suicide rates, we're seeing an increase in this generation, we're seeing an increase in accidental deaths due to drug overdoses, we're seeing more and more kids drop out of school or take leaves of absence due to depression, unheard of. These are all, this is, this is really, So it's fascinating what he was talking about in which we see overall, not just in the millennials, but we all are getting a little bit more antisocial in the social world of today. And more so with the millennials. So it's interesting to see that how do you actually, for a generation that is so impatient and wants instant gratification, brands are still talking about, we want to engage with them, we want to build lifetime loyalty, we want to show them films that are 10 minutes long. They don't have that patience. So how are you going to change the way you actually communicate with them? Um, so we, when we asked our uh, CMOs their biggest challenge in marketing for the next uh, 12 months, they said customer acquisition. 
and customer acquisition of this kind of millennials, which is going to be a whole different ball game compared to how it used to be. Uh, and then when we ask them what you think is going to drive your brand growth, again, the consumer experience came in first because this consumer experience needs to be, as Vivek had said, O to O. It is how they communicate with you online and offline. It needs to be seamless. When we asked about, do you actually think you know your target audience, only 28% and 24% were confident to say that yes, they totally did. Um, because again, this is no longer just about demographics and psychographics. Now with data, you can get to know so much more about your consumers. The question is, how are you going to leverage that? Of course, without completely stalking them, there needs to be that fine line. So one of the things about this new consumer, does anyone know what this stands for? I, W, W, I, W, W, I, W, I. Anyone? I want what I want when I want it. <laughs> that is what it is. And this is an actual term. So I was like, really? That, but, but it is completely and and true, my niece is uh, seven years old and whenever she's angry with her parents, she'll come to me. And she was very upset. She's like, you know, every time, every time I ask my mama, I want something, she keeps telling later, for Christmas, for your birthday. But she's not understanding, she's not understanding. So I said, what is she not understanding? She's not understanding that I want it now. <laughs> and then you have to explain, but you can't get everything now. But you know what? You can, because you have the power of what is called online shopping. So big brands, brands like Burberry, like Tom Ford, like Ralph Lauren, have changed entirely how they sell. Earlier when you used to have these fabulous fashion shows at your London Fashion Week and Paris Fashion Week, it was six months from ramp to store. You see something on the ramp, you admire it from afar, it'll come to the store six months later. Now it's available on the store the same exact day because these brands have realized that they don't have that kind of flexibility of time. They need to give these consumers what they want when they want it. And that is what it is the see now, buy now model. So everything can be purchased. Instagram is trying to get towards it. Whatever you see on Instagram, there would be a button to directly buy it. And that is how impulsive shopping is going to be. It's no longer that you're going to a supermarket at NTUC and at the end of the cashier, you see some chocolates and you pick it up. And that was your impulsive shopping. At least that's the way impulsive shopping was in my time. But now impulsive shopping could be anything from a car to a fashion brand, to a shoe, to a new watch. And you can get everything at the, at, at the time you want. Um, this is an extremely interesting case, which is actually leveraging this insight of this new consumer of who wants to actually get things immediately, but they also are discerning. They are not foolish. They are not going to click on every banner or answer every app and decide that, oh, I'm gonna just buy this. They do want to have that experience. There's so much choice, confusion, and anxiety involved in buying cosmetics. People often stay with what they know. In this environment, how do you get people to trial your product? You give them an entirely new way to try on makeup. Oh my god! Oh, it's exciting, isn't it? This is Makeup Genius from L'Oreal Paris, the first mobile app to let you try on makeup using nothing but your phone. Makeup Genius scans your face and then allows you to select from a huge range of L'Oreal cosmetics. And the result is so realistic, it's like you're actually wearing it. There I am! It's red lipstick! I could look like pure reds. Oh, wow! To users, it seems like magic. But the augmented reality behind Makeup Genius was 18 months in the making, incorporating thousands of products and over 100 unique facial expressions. You can try on just an eyeliner or create complete looks. Once you like what you see, you can save your look and share it with friends. And you can purchase directly from the app. Makeup Genius takes the hassle out of the in-store experience, allowing you to scan products and try them on virtually. The launch of Makeup Genius caused something of a stir.
resulting in over 10 million people downloading it. And so far, they've tried on over 25 million different looks, using over 65 million products. That's 65 million more product trials worldwide. Makeup Genius from L'Oreal Paris. I can't stop looking at myself. <laughs> Now, trend number two. This new consumer is not only about buying now, but it's also about the post-buy experience. So once you've got something, especially when it comes to tech products, gadgets, etc., you do want to make sure that your post-buy experience is actually very seamless. And many times your post-buy experience or the questions are actually answered by chatbots or robots and they're not even humans. But that is something as a part of the customer experience brands have to start looking at and start doing. There's going to be a lot more investment in artificial intelligence and this is not only going to change the customer experience, i.e. how you talk and communicate to the consumer, but also in terms of your lead generation in your B2B sales because now you just have so much data to do predictive modeling and know how your consumers are going to behave based on their past behavior. And this is actually going to change, fundamentally change, the way B2B marketing is done. Um, any fans of How I Met Your Mother? It's one of my favorite shows. And this was, I think, one of the final episodes where uh, Ted makes a call to Marshall, and they just he pretends that they were in some 20, 2050 or 2025, that once he makes a call, his friend's hologram will appear in front of him, and they'll be able to communicate that way because he'll be able to actually see him virtually. It's not very far from where we are. ABBA is talking about holding their first virtual concert in 2018 because fans are dying to see them together and they said maybe not an actual live concert but we might do a virtual one. Again, something that was unthinkable of even a few years ago. Which brings us to our third trend when it comes to this new consumer the emergence and the high acceptance of AR and VR, which is augmented reality and virtual reality. Now, it's very easy to think, or it, you can perceive, okay, augmented reality when it comes to cars, because it's like playing video games, right? You wear something and you imagine you're actually riding on those roads. But now that's actually being taken by most brands. So for example, there's this brand called glasses.com, which allows you to kind of 3D render your face, try different glasses and sunglasses, send it to your friends for their opinion, and then be able to buy the glasses. Um, a big part of the augmented reality and virtual reality, one of the obstacles has always been the hardware because it was very expensive. Oculus, just to get that device to put it on your face, costs like $500. But guess what? Google Cardboard can be purchased for as low as $1.50. So again, that has changed completely how brands are going to use augmented and uh, virtual reality in order to sell their brand, uh, to, in order to sell more products and experiences. It's very easy to imagine it when it comes to hotels or travel because you can actually imagine how it would be to be in a certain place once you put those goggles on. Retail um, real estate is using it a lot because even before you shortlist a location, like do I really want to travel two hours to see somewhere, maybe I can just look at it through virtual reality to decide whether I want to shortlist that particular location or look at how it would be of my new apartment that I'm planning to buy. So the next case study is going to show how uh, augmented and virtual reality is being used by brands.
Did you just get married? You just got married. Just now? <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited, I have to be honest. That's My really hands are sweating. Honeymoon, would you like to go to London right now? Let's do it! usually used to be something that was going to only be in Star Trek, but it actually exists today. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, having said that, we can have as much technology and we can be innovative, but ultimately the one thing that marketing and brands have to do is to listen to their consumers. And that includes brands that are 70 years old and think that they know everything. Everyone needs to constantly be aware of how this consumer is changing. So the three things to remember when it comes to this new uh, consumer, um, brands will need to start collaborating. They need to collaborate with the consumers themselves, with their agency partners, with tech providers, and internally, externally, in order to make these things possible. Uh, it's extremely important to stay hungry and stay curious. Events like these, which give you an opportunity to learn new things, meet people, or what we are talking about, networking and understanding what everyone else is doing is going to be very important. And data can be very scary, but it is, can also be a very, very useful tool in order to predict things about your consumers, about what they would buy, what they may not buy, what kind of consumer experience that they want. So it's extremely important to be attentive to this. Now we're going to move on to our second pillar, which is innovation in technology. This is what the future of smart devices can be, or is pretty much happening now. So when we asked our CMOs, do you understand digital uh, and technology in marketing? Only less than 20% totally agreed, because everyone believes that we have a lot to learn and it's constantly evolving. I'm satisfied with my organization's digital and technology in marketing. 60% disagreed, again, because there is no way it's actually being maximized, and there's a lot that can and should be done. Uh, what would improve the organization's use of technology? A skilled team or agency partners and integration with the overall business strategy. So no more can you just have silos when it comes to uh, technology, marketing, IT, et cetera. It needs to come together. This was very interesting. When we asked, with your capability right now, do you think you've future-proofed yourself for the next three to five years? Only 10% totally agreed with it. 90% said that they actually don't think they are there, and they need to do a lot more to future-proof themselves. This year, it is said that a chief marketing officer is going to spend more on technology, on IT, than your chief innovation officer. That is how much is the impact of technology when it comes to marketing. And when we talk about these marketeers, it is fascinating that these are some of the biggest brands in FMCG and the CPG world. 90 of 100 of them, out of 100, 90 of them actually lost market share last year. And that is completely changing because when we think about marketing, the first brands that come to mind are your Unilevers and PNGs and Nestle's of the world. And they are all losing market share because they need to be able to evolve and adapt a whole lot faster than what they are. And all these marketeers usually have always used loosely called traditional media when it comes to their marketing platforms. So they love their TVCs, they have got their billboards, they have their print ads and radio. But today with digital and technology, even your traditional media can become interactive. And this is a great example of that. Hey, Apotek Hjärtat här. Vi finns för att du ska kunna leva ett längre, friskare liv. Det är därför jag är här. För att lagom till det nya året hjälpa dig skaffa nya, hälsosammare vanor. Vi utrustar den här digitala skärmen med rökdetektorer. Sen placerar vi den här där folk röker mycket. Och varje gång någon tänder en cigarett. Ja, du 
du fattar. So when it comes to technology disruption, um, there are brands that are disrupting just the way everything was done before. So we all know about Airbnb. Maybe five years ago, six years ago, if someone would have told you that you're going to pay good money to go and stay in a stranger's house, you'd be like, mm, yeah, I, I don't know. Why would I do that? I'll just go and stay at a Marriott or a Hilton or a YMCA or wherever I usually do. But Airbnb has fundamentally changed the way we travel, the way we experience things. And it is fascinating that it's a multi-billion dollar company. It sells destinations and homes. It does not own a single real estate. Uber gives you transport. It does not own a single car. And that is what the sharing economy has done today. It actually... If you think about it, it's actually going back to the age, age, age old days of the barter system. You have milk, I have water, maybe we can have a barter in exchange. That's what sharing economy fundamentally is. But it has become a billion dollar industry thanks to the Airbnbs and the Ubers of the world. And it's not just in travel. This kind of disruption is happening everywhere. So if you look at uh, Revolt, it's basically a peer-to-peer -peer lending app. You remember earlier when you needed a loan, you have to go to the bank, you have to fill out 20 different forms, they'll ask you to wait for six weeks. You don't have to do this anymore. So what are banks going to do? Banks have to embrace fintech. They need to start looking at how they are going to leverage these startups and make their services better because these consumers are not standing in lines to visit bank branches anymore. Like even my dad who's 70 years old does mobile banking now. So who's going to go to the banks? Who has time to wait for all these kind of loans and their different kind of systems and processes in place? So it is fascinating how all this is changing. I would urge you to go and look at this uh, brand called Mink. It is started by a Korean uh, lady, if I'm not wrong, and it is basically a makeup printer. So it's actually a printer, a 3D printer, and you can print any color that you see on your computer screen. You can print it in 3D and that then becomes your makeup. It will become your eyeshadow or your blush or whatever you want it to be. So it can be any color. And this printer can be purchased for I think as low as $250. Imagine the amount of money that people spend on makeup because you want to have your entire range, right? You'll buy a small, um, a box of different eyeshadows which probably has three colors out of which you use only one. You don't have to restrict anymore because now you can actually create your own colors and that is what is happening when it comes to technology disrupting your business. All big brands we know, Nestle, P&G, uh, Pepsi, Unilever, look at the, the difference between how much they spend on marketing and how much they spend on R&D. To be honest, R&D in the world of consumer packaged goods is almost become a joke. PepsiCo takes like three months or sometimes eight months to have to innovate. And what's the innovation? A new flavor of chips. In that time, Samsung has probably launched three different phones. And there are 100 different apps that have come out at the same time. On the other side, look at this. These are five companies where their R&D spend in actually exceeds, far exceeds their marketing spend. Companies like Amazon, like Google, like Microsoft, like Samsung. And that is what brands need to look at now as to how are they going to spend on R&D and innovation rather than taking a long time and long cycles to do that and spend a lot just on marketing. Um, what is happening with tech marketing, the other big thing is that you need to talk to these consumers at the right time and at the right place. So we all know about geo-targeting. So you can actually target consumers based on where they are on their, in their location. Um, you can look at targeted messages based on where consumers are, who has seen your ads before, how do you retarget them? Retarget basically means you're actually just sending your ads to someone when they have expressed interest in your brand before. 
Also, if you look at things, media planning itself has become more complex. No longer do you have a few selections of TV channels, you have different publishers like your Netflix and your Spotify and everyone who've come into the picture. So you just have a lot more opportunities to reach out uh, to the consumers. Programmatic media buying is of course something that is extremely critical and again you'll need a whole day just to talk about it. But basically what that is, is that you're buying audiences and you're not buying inventory. That's the fundamental difference and a lot of it can be automized and done by machines rather than humans which makes that you can actually have scale. Now Netflix is another fascinating brand. When Netflix was not in Singapore and my sister in US used to tell me about how she can binge watch, it was a concept that was alien because I was like, no, no, you need to wait every week before the next episode of Grey's Anatomy comes out, otherwise how will you watch it? Like you don't have to because on Netflix you have everything you can watch at one time. And guess what? Netflix actually does not have any advertising. How many people believe Netflix has no advertising? Everyone watches Netflix? No advertising? 79% of the people say they'd rather pay more for their Netflix subscription than have ads. So Netflix knows that. So they don't sell ads. They do what is called product placements. Now product placements are nothing new. Hollywood has been doing it for years. But Netflix actually has taken it one step further and pretty much most of your Netflix original um, movie show, TV shows that are there will have a huge form of product placements. And this is brands paying the shows. So Netflix also becomes a media channel through the shows that which you can advertise on. Then we were talking about um, technology in terms of how you can actually look at your ROI. This is a fascinating statistic that when you do online shopping, when it comes to e-commerce, 67% of online shopping is actually abandoned. That means you will start, you will click, you'll go to a certain page, but you will not purchase. This could be for lots of different reasons. You don't want to do it at that time, or the user experience of that site is not good. I mean, how long do you wait for a page to load up? Three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds? No one waits for more than a minute. That also would be too much. So there are lots of ways in which people abandon their cards. And the number is that $4 trillion worth of merchandising is actually going to waste. And out of that, 63% is actually recoverable. And that is what technology can do when it comes to your marketing ROI. And as very well told by um, the chairman at Singtel, is that you really need to marry science and art when it comes to marketing. It is not just about hardcore creativity and art alone. Um, so combine your forces, look at your partners as well as internally, invest in R&D and embrace data as scary as it may sound. Lastly, we're gonna look at partnerships. So partnerships is, as I mentioned, it is, goes beyond just your agencies. It's the entire ecosystem that you have. Uh, again, in our uh, survey, they said that uh, most CMOs work with digital agencies, but we found a lot of newer type of agencies and partners in the mix, like UX, UI agencies, consultants, tech vendors, um, and thus the ecosystem is getting a lot more complicated. Uh, in order to increase this complication, consultancies like a McKenzie and Accenture, a PwC, are actually buying agencies and coming into the marketing space. The M&A value of these kind of um, acquisitions last year alone was over two billion. Um, brands are looking at different agency models. So some of them are moving things in-house. Just today it was launched that Starhub in Singapore is actually opened its new social media and analytics agency called Curiosity, which is basically going to be their in-house agency. So they're not going to be using agencies anymore. Now, of course, in-house is not something that everyone can do. There are lots of factors at play. Uh, but the fact is that this is happening. Uh, Marriott, an another great example, who's actually developing content on their own. They are, they are developing content films, like a Bollywood film, but much, uh, Hollywood film, but much shorter, uh, to sell more of their hotels. But they're just doing it in a very clever manner. 
just going to skip this. And the other big trend that is happening is the use of robots and chatbots. Um, there is this lingerie brand which um, found an uplift of sales of um, a huge percent just because they started using an AI-enabled robot called, they call him Albert, to actually do um, their media placements online as well as their creative. So when it comes to dynamic creative optimization, you actually can have multiple different messages, multiple different images, just cross keep on doing different permutations and combinations to see what works best. And that, of course, cannot just be a human effort. So there is a lot happening in this space when it comes to non-human touch in advertising and marketing. I'm skipping that video because I was just shown a time that I have less time and I wanted to leave some time uh, with you for questions. This is an interesting quote by the founder of Chirp on how you need to have people who know about advertising and marketing to partner with you in order to do better. So brands are now in kind of think, them, think of themselves as a conductor in an orchestra where they actually look at all these different partners, whether it's your tech vendors, uh, whether it's agencies, whether it's consultants, everyone coming together. Um, it is extremely important for marketers to strengthen their internal teams, to send their people to sessions like these, to trainings, having workshops. Because if you don't build the internal capabilities, you're not going to be able to get better in this fast dynamic environment. And of course, keeping an open mind. Robots are bloody scary. And to know that they actually can be more creative than humans and buy ads and do everything can be daunting, but it's important for marketers and brands to test and learn these different new avenues to do things. So on a parting note, if you forget everything I say today, just remember these three things. Consumer, in order to attract this new consumer, it is extremely important for you to understand how their consumer journey has changed and what are their different pain points and how you're going to alleviate them. Our technology, R&D and data are going to be extremely critical for you to be able to do breakthrough marketing. And finally, when it comes to partnerships, you need to redefine your agency and look at who are the different partners in the ecosystem that you need to get along with in order to create a more optimized and better ROI planned marketing effort. Now all this, we have seen a fabulous case studies here, but we always have to remember that those, every good work that you see for that, there are at least 50 really rubbish work out there. And it is a question of learning, testing, learning again and redoing. So while success might look like, oh wow, this is successful, you don't know what everything that happens under the iceberg and all the effort, the pain, the time, that talent is constantly taking to learning, to innovate, in order to make something a success. So on a parting note, uh, every presentation must have a Steve Jobs quote, so I had to add one in. But I really like this one because it's totally relevant uh, for this entire event, that if learning stops today, innovation stops tomorrow. Thank you very much. So let me know questions. We have 10 minutes for questions. That's why I spoke really fast in the last section. Hi, Seema. Uh, Hi. Just check with you if you were to tie your whole presentation in a quick one line or something, how you tie it to PMEs and job markets? So when it comes to overall with PMEs and especially the job market, I think, and I know you will hear these words a lot in this, uh, in this week of events, but the most important thing is to stay curious. And I know this is cliche, but there is no other way to sum up innovation because innovation today is not dedicated or something that only one person or set of people can do. And only if you're constantly learning, constantly reading, and asking a lot of questions. No one person is an expert, and experts need help nowadays. Plus, there are so many different multidiscipline topics that it's extremely important to share and ask questions to the relevant people so you can learn more. And that would be definitely one of the biggest takeouts for anything to do with innovation.
Thanks for sharing. Your focus very much on millennials. How about what will be your insight to us, the silver population, which is growing? Thank you. Um, that's a very good, uh, good point. I think millennials are always used as a way to make a point because then you can actually show how things have changed so drastically when you use them for an example. However, things have really changed with technology. It's also changed a lot with the silver segment also. And their adoption of technology is a lot faster than we think that it is. You might think that, oh, they may not be as uh, tech savvy, but once they actually get hooked onto it, then technology is also looking at how their lives are getting disruptive. I'm sure like most of our uh, parents, a lot of uh, people from the silver, uh, silver segment, when it comes to travel, they are booking their flights online. Maybe it took them a while to move from the travel agent mentality to actually book things online. But things like travel, like banks, all these things are going to be used by the silver segment because actually it is a lot more convenient for them. Amazon and e-commerce uh, e shopping has completely changed uh, the way this segment lives because you no longer need to drive your car, go to a mall, park it and go and buy your things. You can actually get them delivered. So it is a mindset. But what works when it comes to human nature is these millennials are now teaching their parents and their grandparents how easy it is to get your groceries from a red mark, to order your cabs from Uber. And technology is such that it is very easy to use once you get the hang of it. So I think all these findings and everything that's happening is as relevant to the silver segment as it would be to the millennials. Right, one more. Yes. Just now you mentioned about programmatic media buying. Yes. Can, can you explain one more time? Sure. So as I mentioned, programmatic media buying is actually a whole day session of its own. But basically what it means is that traditionally when you bought media, you bought inventory i.e. I will buy a 30 second spot on Media Corp. I will buy a billboard on Orchard Road. I will buy three full page ads on, on Straits Times. That's the way media was bought. Programmatic has changed that you are actually buying audiences. So because digital has so much data, you can go to a Facebook and say, I am looking for audiences which are between the age group of 25 to 35, they tend to be first time moms and they live in this kind of urban areas. So usual demographics that we used to have, but Facebook can actually, and by Facebook I mean Google, Facebook, anyone in digitally can actually make sure that your ad is being shown to that target audience. So you're buying audiences versus buying media. That is fundamentally what programmatic is. But of course it's a it's a deep, big black hole because there is a lot of technology behind it and a lot of different partners that come into place. So in terms of the technology behind it, it is complicated. The way brands pay their agencies in programmatic is getting complex. But ultimately, the big difference is that you don't buy inventory, you buy audiences. So that means your, your brands and your work and your messaging is actually going to the right people at the right time. You know, nowadays, uh, uh, there's so much uh, disruptive innovation and, uh, you know, and sometimes the technology is, is uh, outdated so fast. So uh, let's say you want to be, uh, be, be competitive, how do you keep ahead of your, your competition and, and be better than them? Is there any technology or any, any kind of thing that you can do to be able to be better than your, your competitors? I think one of the key things to be better than the competition is to actually stay ahead of your training and your reading and your learning. Because only when you do that will you be able to know what's happening or what's going to happen. And so there is no magic bullet or one pill that you can take and you will be able to always have um, that kind of advancement to your competitors. But the most important thing would be an attitude. You need to have an attitude to want to learn and do things differently. Uh, in order to make that impact. Hi, sorry, I have a question for you. Now, um, it's basically something to do with the background as well. Now, uh, will advertising agencies and design firms be eventually obsolete with the growing pool of freelancers in Singapore right now? 
very loaded question. Um, uh, yes, the, I personally, I don't think it's going to be obsolete. But what will happen is that agencies need to start reinventing on how they approach and work with clients. So earlier it used to be you give a brief to the agency, the agency will read it and tell you, okay, my creative director is going to think about it. We'll come back to you in three weeks time. The creative director reads it three hours before the presentation and then comes. I'm exaggerating, but what happens is that that kind of time is not going to be possible. And an agency is never going to be able to employ everyone that the client is going to need. So clients now need a lot of user experience people. It may not be possible for all agencies to have all of them. So you're going to need freelancers. So the word that we use a lot in R3 is the ecosystem. That it's not like one person or one party will be obsolete, but the ecosystem has evolved so much that everyone needs to know who to tap onto at the right time. Did I answer your question? Probably time for one last. No? Um, hi, um, just want to share various platforms of social media, right? So how can it be relevant to B2B marketing? Uh, so when it comes to B2B marketing, uh, your obvious social media platform would be LinkedIn because it helps you create groups and connect uh, to different, to your audiences. But what is also seen is that in B2B marketing, um, even platforms like Facebook are coming into play because a B2B marketer, you're talking to a B, which is a business, but you're not talking to a building, you're not talking to an entity, you're ultimately talking to the procurement person in that business, you're talking to the CTO, you're talking to someone who you're gonna sell to, so ultimately that person is a consumer too. So what B2B marketers need to do is to know how to engage with them at a human level. So you don't want to become and send them like Facebook messages every day or wish them on Valentine's Day or send them WhatsApp messages, but things about when B2B marketers write thought papers or insights or white papers, it's a good platform through social media to be able to give it to these people so they will have that brand engagement with you. So you still need to engage with them, you just need to think of what content you're going to use to engage. So social media is as relevant for B2B because ultimately it's only a platform. What you do with that platform counts. So it's more about developing the content that is going to be most suitable to them. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you very much.